What a tragedy that a people of God would ever treat Yahweh the way idol worshipers treat their idols. The only time we visit God is in a time of disaster. The only time we concern ourselves with any interest in God is when things aren't going well at home. Apparently we need to get to church and everything will get better. What a tragedy it is when professors of the Lord Jesus Christ, the only time that they make visit of God is whenever they feel as though God might do something to aid them, to personally benefit them. There's no consideration of all of living a life humbly before Almighty God, desiring to walk honestly, obediently before Him, desiring to present ourselves, as the Apostle Paul would say, as a living sacrifice. Not one who's thinking, well, apparently God needs me to die in order to know how serious I was about how badly I needed Him. If you think about the times when you've prayed to God and it appears as though He wasn't listening, Have you ever had seasons like that? Problem is, have you ever considered the motivation or the reasons why you're approaching God to begin with? Can I encourage you in this? That you take serious evaluation of your attitude and your understanding of who Yahweh is. You treat Him like like every other idol in the world, do not expect Him to be be pleased that you're worshiping Him like, like, like others worship a rock. There is no comparison. Do not treat Him like a genie in a bottle. God is not such that we rub a, that we rub a bottle and He puffs out in some mysterious mist and, and then tells us that He is bound to do whatever we command Him to do. Well, th- that is not the Almighty God. You have not given yourself at all to the worship of God. You've given yourself to a God that you want to dream up for yourself. And that God can do nothing for you. And so you go to this... You, you, you even will behave like the Israelites. Two times we, ha- we see it recorded in Scripture... You're you're familiar mostly with the time in in the desert when they're coming out of Egypt and Moses is up on the mountain. You remember what the people begin to do? They think, well, apparently Moses isn't coming back. And so they turn to their priest Aaron and they say, Aaron, make for us a God so that we may worship him. Give us, a, give us that which we remember back when we were in Egypt so that we'll... And, and listen, Aaron, we're pleased to give this idol the name Yahweh, by the way. Matter of fact, if you go and look at the very language of that encounter, that's exactly what Aaron instructs the people to do. He points to that golden calf that he made from their gold, and he, and he says, Behold your God who brought you out of Egypt. Aaron is literally saying, Behold Yahweh who brought you out of Egypt. Look at Him. The golden calf. Shame on God's people to treat Almighty God like the way they treat other idol gods. Second time the nation of Israel does this is really at the inception of the division of the kingdoms. And you remember the first king of the northern kingdom, Jeroboam? He one-ups Aaron in the desert. He one-ups him in a bad way. Jeroboam is not even a priest. He has no business representing God at all to the nation. He's not of the kingly line either. Jeroboam is, by the way, if you look at, you read the kings, 1st and 2nd kings, you'll remember that every king of the northern kingdom is held under the sins of Jeroboam. What Jeroboam introduces to the northern kingdom, every succeeding king, who's not necessarily out of his bloodline, sometimes they're there are insurrections of people inside of the nation who overcome and declare themselves king. 
inside of that, Jeroboam comes and he says, you know what? It's really inconvenient for the people in the northern kingdom to travel all the way to Jerusalem to worship God. So let's make worship of God convenient for them. Let's put up a temple here and let's build a temple here. And while we're at it, you know what? Every other God, every other nation around us has a God that they can see. You can almost even imagine Jeroboam having the Moabites in mind. You know, when I travel, and I'm, I'm just giving a, 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 an idea of a plausibility that there could have been a hundred things that Jeroboam must have been thinking. But on a travel one day through the nation of Moab, you know what I saw? I saw this beautiful, ornate temple. And they had outside of it their god, Chamash. He was impressive. People were bringing their children and sacrificing them. They were bringing their money and leaving it there. That was impressive. You can build a case for that because you know what, I, you know what Jeroboam does is he gathers a group of people around him and tells, tells these people of, from a survey of the people, tell me, what do the people want? And so Jeroboam gives the people what they want. And they... They know they cannot abandon Yahweh. So what what does Jeroboam do? But he instructs the goldsmiths, the masters of craft, to build not one, but two golden calves. And he tells the northern kingdom, Behold your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Behold your Yahweh. We cannot treat God like this. He is no dumb, lifeless, deaf, unable to do anything piece of rock. He is the Almighty God. Maybe God, maybe your prayers to God appear to be not heard because you're praying against the nature of God. Have you ever stopped to? Think about that. Your prayers may not be in accordance with the will of God or the nature of God. You might be looking at verse 12 and you think, well, you know, the God of Moab is no different than the time, that one time when I prayed to God and he didn't hear me. We would just stop and take inventory. What were you asking God to do? What, 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 what motivation, what attitude were you praying to God in in that case? Are you, were you asking God to bless your hand at this task while your hands are guilty of sin on a hundred other things? And you, and, and you get angry at God because He won't bless your activity in this case while you're arrogantly, proudfully entangled in all kinds of filthy ungodliness. And yet, there'll be a demand from you that God must hear you because you prayed to Him. You've not considered the attitude or the mindset. You've not humbled yourself. You see, the difference of of how the Moabites responded to the the deafness of their unable to hear God and the silence of a God who not only hears but also answers our prayers is that these people are responding in their arrogance. Arrogance. As long as we stand to respond in arrogance toward Yahweh rather than in humility, in submission to Him, it might appear as though God's not hearing your your prayer either. You're asking God to bless your hand while your hands are guilty. Are you harboring unforgiveness toward another while you're pleading God would cause someone to forgive your sin? Are you petitioning him in pretense? Are there selfish ambitions behind your request that God would give or allow or do? Have you ever said, I've, I've tried everything else, let's, let's just give God a try? Now you're behaving like the Moabites. Oh, I've tried everything else, I guess we ought to go down to the temple. How, how many times as a pastor in this city 
either in recent days or in the 17 years that I've been here that I've been called on either by a county jail or by the, the, the hospital system and been asked to come and to sit with someone who's, who wants to hear from a pastor in the community. And, and I go and I sit and I listen and, and, and I hear the similar kinds of pleas. I've tried everything else. I think I need to try God. Now listen, uh, when I hear someone say that, I say, oh, I, I hope you will. I pray you will. I hope you'll completely devote yourself into what God wants to do in your life. But don't just come to Him today because you've tried everything else. So I might as well try God. What will it hurt? No, come to Him in full awareness, in full, in full, with, your, with your mind fully engaged in who He is. Stop praying against God's will and stop praying against the prayers of others. This is one of, the, one of the most bizarre things that happen in corporate prayer. You gather a people, of, gather a people together to pray, and, and you're praying. Perhaps it's for someone who's sick, and we ought to pray for the sick. You know, one person knows why someone might be sick, and everyone else is praying, oh, God, bless them with good health. And it could be that their sickness is a result of a direct sin that they're engaged in. We must be careful what we ask God for. Do we know everything that God knows? Or are we going to just simply come and present ourselves humbly before God and plead for His will to be done and then to be satisfied? You know, it's Henry Blackaby that, that taught me this, the missionary in Canada with the North American Mission Board. He says that when we pray, we should expect that as soon as we're done praying, that God's answer is already either in place or on the way. Through a messenger, through a, a circumstance, or it's, it's while we're praying that the revelation of who God is from His Word reveals to us what we need to do. What I would say to, what I would say to us today is we must take a serious inventory of the way we're treating Almighty God. Are you treating Him like a lump, like a rock in a field? You have no interest in Him until all of a sudden you have some kind of a need for Him. And so you rush to Him, you go to Him, you do everything you can think that you've been told to do to Him. Oh, why not today just humbly submit yourself to walk in His commandments, to honor Him with your life, to obey Him with your words, to obey Him in the workplace, to honor Him in the marketplace, to display His glory in your conversation, to let His Lordship govern your entertainment, to let Him rule all of your life. Will you not treat Him like the living God that He is today? Well, Moab's disaster stands as a reminder to us, it stands as a, as a picture. You do not want to treat God like this, and you do not want to abandon God for worthless gods. Give yourself to God, totally. Live for Him with joy and with pleasure.